Howdy folks, let's take a deeper look at the 3rd edition Malifaux Strats and Schemes. Howdy folks, Craig and Ray here on the third floor. We're going to take a couple minutes and talk about the strategies and schemes that we're seeing in the third edition of Malifaux. We're currently in the open beta. We're filming this in mid to late January, so things may be changing uh, from what you see here, but we thought we'd take a first look and uh, give our thoughts. So Ray, in general, let's talk about just the overall structure of how the strategies and schemes work. So we have a total of eight points, victory points that are possible every game that you're going to play, uh, playing in five rounds. Um, and the way the strategies work is they're on a sliding scale. So the first point you get is fairly easy to get, second point's fairly easy. But after that, the third and fourth, fourth points you're really going to have to fight for because you have to, at whatever the strategy you're doing, you kind of have to succeed at it more than you did previously to score the next point. And we'll go over the details about that in a second. So it's four, four points for strategies. Four points for strategies. And then you pick two schemes? Two schemes, flipping five schemes, and uh, you pick two of those um, for your pool. And you get a maximum of two points per scheme. Okay. You get a reveal, and that'll give you one point. Again, the reveals are fairly easy to do. And then you get a second point for an end game condition, regardless of how many rounds you go. So if we're talking tournament play and you only get to round three, then that's when it's going to trigger. So that's definitely a uh, makes it a lot tougher. Right. So. So it sounds like really kind of getting those four points is a somewhat reasonable expectation. Yep. Two from the strategy, one from each scheme, but it's the, getting that fifth, it's sixth, the fifth and, through okay. eighth. Yeah, okay. the fifth rate's really where it's going to come down to. So. And we got a little bit of a unique perspective because Ray's been very involved in the beta, both yeah. the closed beta and the open beta. I have yet to play um, any games of uh, of uh, the third edition, so it will be kind of uh, two different perspectives on it. Um, so let's start off and let's talk about uh, the, four, the different strategies. So I'm going to start off with the first one, Turf War. You start off by dividing the table into four open table quarters. In the center of each uh, table quarter, you place a neutral strategy marker. Place another neutral strategy marker in the center of the table. Strategy markers are impassable. So that's five strategy markers total, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. One in each quarter and then one in the center. And I want to draw specific attention to the impassable. That's, that's a very big deal. Yeah. And... Uh, 30, 30 millimeter because by default all, all markers, markers are 30, 30 millimeter mil, unless specified otherwise right and then strategy markers can be either friendly neutral or enemy a strategy marker friendly to one player is the enemy to the other and vice versa a model can make an interact action targeting a strategy marker and base contact with it to change its alignment from enemy to neutral or from neutral to friendly so you interact with it and you flip it, right? Basically. So if it's neutral, it becomes friendly. Mm -hmm. If it's enemy, it becomes friendly. No, if it's enemy, it becomes neutral. Oh, okay. So it takes two interacts to make it friendly. It takes two interacts. Gotcha. Yeah. Which is a big deal. <laughs> I bet. That's a huge deal. But uh, the next part uh, makes it a little bit more interesting. So when a friendly model kills an enemy model, it can change one strategy marker in the same table quarter as the killed model from the enemy to neutral, if possible. The marker in the center is considered to be in every table quarter. So wow! So you Completely. kill a you kill a model, mm -hmm. and if you kill a model where there's a friendly marker, it can be turned to neutral. Yeah, or, or an, an enemy, an marker. enemy it marker. It can be turned to neutral. Turned neutral. And with that center being in all quarters, yeah. that's always available. Yeah, it's always available. So it's like trying to lock down the center. It's uh, the center t marker for me has really kind of always been a very much a win more kind of situation. If you're able to hold that center marker, it probably means you're in a pretty good position. M3E doesn't have as much killing um, as you would think, despite the amount of engagements and like, you know, being able to walk and charge. Yep. You're still only swinging once. Engagement ranges are between zero to one, mostly. Uh, there's not that many two inches any, you know, so there's it's one of those situations where you're not killing as much as you think you're going to kill But this strategy really rewards you for intelligent killing gotcha So you have the option of either interacting or killing either one right. But the, the key is is that to make it friendly you have to interact because you can't do that by killing correct got you it. Absolutely have to so it's got to be that balance You can't just come in. I'm gonna murder everything and it's gonna be great You still got to be able to have that those action points to be able to, to flip it to score Got it. So if a model's in more than one table quarter, the model that uh, the model that killed it might decide which table quarter the model is on. So boy, that's you, not only that, but you've got models that are vulnerable 
you have to worry about where they are too. Absolutely, and like large bases really suffer here sometimes because you end up in that situation where there's not a ton of pushes in M3E, but there's enough. Right. And there's enough repositioning in M3E. Um, and there's a couple of factions that are really, really good at like you know marking things off, like you know Neverborn with Euripides, or you know most of the 10T factions got a lot of repositioning. You got the Bells, you know, in uh, in Resers and other you know other models and factions have this ability to just make slight movement changes and being able to take a big Big model and throw it on the middle line, you know, on one of those those dissecting lines, and then take it out, is is it's potentially huge, it's, yeah. you know, because not every model that's big is you know a high cost model that's hard to kill. There's quite a few forty and fifty mils that are still relatively easy to put down because they're either scheme runners or they're support pieces. Sure, or or the, you've worn them down, right? Yeah, or you've just worn them down through yep. the natural course of the play. So it's like this gets really tough when you start getting to turns four and five because you start running out of models at a certain point. Um, so action point economy, action point efficiency is really, really important. And I, it's one of the reasons I really like the new turf war um, is because it really rewards you for resource management, which is one yeah. of the aspects of, of Malifaux that um, we all love is kind of like you got your cards, you got your stones, you got your models, you got your AP, you know, and that really, this this one definitely exemplifies all of that. Yeah, it's interesting because it sounds like initially it's board control and killing. But in reality, positioning is huge. Because I was just oh, thinking yeah. about if I have if I kill an enemy model that's on one of those lines, mm -hmm. I now have three potential markers I could flip. Yeah. My choice of three. Yeah. One in each quarter as well as that central right. one still. It also rewards ranged a lot too if you very calculated range. Oh yeah. Range Good assaults. point. Good point. So it mentions that if a model's in more than one table quarter, uh, you, you get to choose. And then um, at the end of each turn, this is how it's actually scored. At the end of each turn, a crew gains one victory point if it has more friendly strategy markers then uh, it has scored VP for this strategy. And that's when you're talking about the ramping. Yeah, that's the ramp. So I just need one friendly, or let's see, yeah, one friendly mm -hmm. to get a point. Yep. Then I need two friendlies to get the second point. Yep. And then so on and so and forth. so on and so forth. So to get that fourth point, I need four friendlies out of the five. Right. And the thing that's really interesting about this concept that all the strategies do with this kind of sliding scale is that uh, if you miss a turn, like it, you've missed it, like it's there, like you can't get all four victory points prior to turn five because one of the big things that uh, we haven't mentioned is that you can't score points on turn mm -hmm. one. So you start on turn two. So in the case of turf four, turn two, you need one marker. Yep. You score that turn three, you need two markers. So that means to get the full four points, you have to score turf four every single turn. And that's what makes these so difficult is that you can't, it, it's not a situation where it's like, well, I missed this turn, so I'll just kind of try to double up next turn. Like, you can't double up because the threshold that you're trying to beat was the score you had previously. Right, right. But I think another aspect that would be interesting, too, is that catching up isn't as difficult as, as it might have right. been otherwise, right? right? So let's say turn two, you score. Mm -hmm. Turn three, you score. Right. Come turn four, you're going to have to get three uh, three markers. Right. I only still need one. You still only one. need one. Right. And that, that definitely enters play a lot. Yeah. And I've had a lot of close games where that has been the case where you think you've got full control over everything, but then when you try to get that third marker... Um, and it, it really rewards good deployment. It rewards good crew construction, building to the strategy. It's really, you know, it's always it's always an important thing. But uh, you feel a little bit more rewarded here when you deploy well and stuff like hmm. that. Because, like, in standard deployment is a prime example. It's like, I think it's 10 inches up the board. It's 8 or 10 inches eight, up the board. Yeah. It's 8 inches up the board. And then, so these markers, halfway and a quarter, are, um, I think, 9 inches up. Got it. So you can have a model move interact turn one. So you've got two markers on a standard deployment on your side of the board. You can flip immediately. Mm -hmm. So trying to get those two points there is pretty easy, but trying to deny those two points can be kind of hard. Right. But the person who positions, deploys, and uses the tools from their faction well enough to deny that turn two or turn three score, that person's in a great position. I'll tell you what else I like about it, and I really, having read all of these, I've kind of felt it. And what I'm hearing, too, is that you're encouraged to get across to the other side. Of the board, Absolutely, right? 100%. So in your scenario, turn one, we both flip our two markers. Mm -hmm. Then we're pushing to the center and pushing to the other quarter yes. to try to deny. Yeah, absolutely. Denial is a huge part of M3E. Very, very cool. So that's Turf War. Let's talk plan explosives. This is the one on the tome. Turf War was on the ram. After deployment, starting with the player with the initiative, each player, alter each player alternates placing 
explosive tokens on their deployed models until each player has placed a total of five explosive tokens on their models. So you've deployed, you've got your models, mm -hmm. and you've got a total of five markers. Yep. You can put as many as you want on a single model. No, you can actually. You can't. Yeah, that's actually oh, the up, next best. Up to one explosive token can be placed on each minion. Mm -hmm. Up to two explosive tokens can be placed on each enforcer, henchman, or master. I got yeah. it. So they're going to be somewhat spread around. They, yeah, and, and that's really good design on Weird's part for that concept because, you know, like you were just saying, you just you can load up like a super tank and be like, this guy's going to be the one that deploys it. And, um, you can't do that here because you've got to be able to spread them out. Now, it's I've commonly put two on like an enforcer or mm -hmm. a henchman, or especially if I have a mobile master type thing. Like I play Ten Thunders primarily, so Masaki. Well, comes let's to let's. Mind, I'm so. gonna interrupt you just a second. Let's quickly build through because I'm very interested in hearing how these strategies work. Yep. A model with more than uh, with one or more explosive tokens can take an interact action to discard an explosive token and place a strategy marker in base contact with itself. Mm -hmm. Strategy markers cannot be placed within six inches of another friendly strategy marker. So we're going out and we're deploying the bombs. Yep, 100%. A model in base contact with a strategy marker can take an interact action to discard the strategy marker and gain an explosive token. So you can drop them and pick them up. Yeah, okay. and I think the big key to take away there is that strategy markers aren't, it doesn't matter what type. It right. It doesn't matter if it's friendly or enemy. It doesn't matter who owned the bomb. Right. right. It doesn't who matter who the owned the bomb. Got it. Yeah, what matters is that it's, the bomb's on the field now. Anyone can go by and pick it up now. Got it. Got it. If, um, if a model with one or more explosive tokens is killed, a model in the opposing crew that is within three inches of the killed model may gain the killed model's explosive tokens. Otherwise, they're discarded. So, that's interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. At the end of each turn, a crew gains one victory point if there are more strategy markers on the opponent's half of the table than the crew has earned victory points from the strategy. Strategy markers on the center line count as being on both table halves. Wow. Okay. So you were talking about the last one about the whole concept of having to push into your other opponent's side of the table. Like, this is, this is it here. Like, yeah. This is absolutely the king of the crop there. Um, so you're saying about Ten Thunders? So in Ten Thunders, we have a uh, Masaki, and uh, I don't want to talk too much about it. We can do that else, uh, elsewhere. But she can carry two bombs. Right. And then she has her whole thing where she can bury and then pop up by a shadow marker. Mm -hmm. So, like, there are specific models that you're going to want to drop two bombs on. Like, she's a great example of one because yep. she's just going to get past the enemy and then drop a bomb and then bury her and pop up, you know... 10, 12, 14 inches away or whatever, you know, shenanigans that she can do and drop her the other bomb. And it's kind of, the, the opponent really has to dedicate resources to kind of go after that. Mm -hmm. um, so mobility is a huge player in the plant explosives uh, scheme. But the thing about it that's interesting is that that six inch requirement, it comes in way more often than you think it will yeah. because you the, the game still you know you still have the other schemes that you got to be trying to do and a lot of them encourage engaging with your opponent and then of course there's the whole if you disengage you can't take an interact action yeah. so if someone ties you up you're not dropping a bomb that turn unless someone else kills that model before your bomb your bomb carrier activates yep um or they have don't mind me or something of that nature. And then the other thing that's really, really cool about the strategy is is that whole counterplay where you might drop a bomb on a line because that's how you gotta get that point, but maybe I gotta maybe I come in the next turn first activation, pick that bomb right up, and now you've gotta drop two bombs. Right. And they're they're a limited resource. And again, this is a range thing that, you know, you can if you're really cagey with how you do your range stuff. Uh, being able to snipe out a bomb carrier, even though you don't get the bomb, you deny your opponent one. And if you deny your opponent two bombs, you've denied them one victory point. Yep. Just flat out, they can't get that fourth victory point. Interesting. So it's it can be very, very uh, hard to score more than two points on this because people can take your bombs, steal your bombs, and then you're in a situation where you're like, well, my opponent's got six bombs and I have two and I need three. Mm -hmm. So now who do I have to kill to steal their bomb? <laughs> or where do I have to get to to pick up my opponent's bomb just to be able to keep scoring this scheme? So whenever I read, you know, a strategy. strategy. Yeah, whenever I read a strategy or schemes, you know, one of the things I try to think about is, you know, how is this going to impact how I build my crew? And what I find immediately interesting about this is, 
My first thing is mobility, right? Absolutely. But then 100%. I think a little bit more about it and I go, well, tankiness would be good. Yeah. And then I think, well, being killy would be good. Yeah. And then I think, well, being able to kill close would be good because I'm picking up potential to get to pick bomb up bombs. markers. <laughs> Having some scheme runners would be good right. because then I can run. And it's just like, I like that. Yeah. I like that there's like, several different angles. Yeah. You can absolutely take multiple vectors on it. And I have taken multiple vectors with plant explosives. I've done from the Yon Low super tank to like, you know, here's Lynch just going to like, you know, murder anything that gets near, yeah. uh, near him with Huggy. And it's like, they all all seem to work and I played it into guild a lot and their range thing where it's like you know what that's a bomb carrier that's a minion I'm just going to snipe it off the table with all of my focused range shots and uh, deny you a bomb and it's like it puts pressure on you sure sure very very cool all right we got two more to go corrupted idols this is the one on the mask at the start of each turn after determining which player has initiative place a strategy marker centered on the center line the location of the strategy marker is determined by the suit of the initiative flip of the player with initiative. And the direction is calculated from that player's perspective. So on a mask, it goes eight inches from where the center line meets the board edge. Tome, eight inches from where the center line meets the board edge on the right. On a ram, it's on the center. On a crow, where the center line meets the table edge. The player with initiative chooses which table edge. And on a joker, you reflip. So one marker. One marker. And it's... Constantly being deployed at the beginning. Now, uh, I guess we'll get into it, but um, if the strategy marker would be placed on top of an existing strategy marker, the player with initiative instead places the strategy marker evenly on the center line, touching but not overlapping the existing strategy marker and not overlapping any other strategy markers. If this is not possible, the strategy marker is not placed. That's actually a very <coughs> important thing because depending on how you deploy your terrain. So right. if you have impassable terrain on that near that eight inch center point and like there was a model nearby there yeah you can run into a sit that wasn't able to move the marker there you can run into a situation where their marker doesn't get placed. got it it's got happened it. to several times that makes sense then a model in base contact with the strategy marker can take an interact action and suffer up to three irreducible damage ignoring hard to kill a model that's interesting yeah. a model may not suffer more damage than its current health so you can still kill the model. Yes. The model can still kill itself, mm -hmm. but if I only have two health left, I can't do take three damage. You can't take three damage. Okay. Place the strategy marker anywhere within X inches of its current location, not in base contact with a model or impassable terrain, where X is equal to the amount of damage suffered by the interacting model, even if, the ki if it was killed by the damage it suffered. So at the end of each turn, the crew gains one victory point if it has more strategy markers completely on the opponent's half of the table than it has victory points from the strategy. Wow. This is, for me, the hardest strategy to deal with. And there's a multitude of reasons. So in Turf War, you have set stuff. Yep. And in Planet Explosives, you know who carries the bomb. Yep. In Corrupted Idols, you have no idea where that marker is coming. Well, you do, but you don't because you can cheat initiative, right? You can cheat initiative. And that's something that is like really, really intriguing. Um, and it makes the whole who's the active player really matter because yeah. whoever had an issue previously is the per and ties is the person who has to cheat first type thing. So it puts it in that really awkward situation where if you know you've got a ten and your opponent flipped a three for initiative and you're like, well, I'll pass. Well, now your opponent's got some really interesting options. Yeah. Because now you have a situation where, like, do I cheat lower? Because I want to put that marker somebody somewhere else, mm -hmm. you know. So it uh, it opens up some very interesting things, especially with like Ma Tucket, who gets benefits off of you know the initiative. Um, so it's a really cool choice, and the fact that they can pop on the same location twice is really hard because if you deploy incorrectly and you deploy it on like the right flank, and then yep. all the markers are on the left flank in the center, like that's that's a mess that's up. A problem. That's yeah. a problem. So. So there's a total of potentially five markers, right? Potentially one, five. One of each on each turn, but mm -hmm. you can't score on turn one. Can't score so on turn one. Coming into turn two, when I can score, barring some strangeness, I'll have two markers. You'll have two markers on the table. Got it. And they could be right next to each other. Oh, they absolutely could be. Very, like it's very not. Cool. I've seen the center one drop twice, and then like it's a big scrum in the center. And then so and then the other thing, it's like we we can talk for literally hours about the counter plays for trying to deal with where they get placed. But the other really big thing is that you got to take damage to move them. Yeah. Yep. So it's like you've got to bring a crew that, again, back to what you were talking about that you love to play explosives. It's mobile. It's tanky. Um, it's killy. So you can try to deny your opponent hit points because healing. Hit point, yeah, because hit points are now a resource. Yeah. You know they've always they're always kind of a resource, but now they really it, health is really a resource here because it's how you score. Yep. And uh, it's just a, it's a really interesting strategy that really changes how you play the game. 
It's cool. Very, very cool. All right, the last one, Reckoning. This is the one on the crow. At the end of each turn, a crew gains one victory point. If more enemy models were killed that turn, then it has scored VP for the strategy. If there are no more enemy models in play, or if there's no more enemy models in play. For the purpose of this strategy, enemy leaders and masters each count as three models when killed. Um, definitely the simplest one. Um, Absolutely. Not a wall of text. And we've seen, you know, in previous editions of the game, we've seen lots of different versions of Reckoning. Um, yep. But, uh, and this is still killing. It's interesting because it's n it's not killing more than your than your opponent, which is usually what you'll what you right. would see. It, it's this it's is, killing against yourself, really. Right. So you, <laughs> you're ramping up, and you've got to space it out. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Because uh, I wouldn't. I, killing four models turn two does you no good. Unless you're going to table your opponent. Unless they're, the goal is to table your opponent. And that can be really hard if you pick the wrong targets. Right. You know, um, like, uh, again, going to 10 Thunders because it's the well I, I know that I have the most information on. Um, Kitty Dumont is an incredibly mobile model. Or Jan Lowe is an incredibly yeah. mobile model. And it's like, if that's kind of your last model, you might be in a situation where you're never going to catch me. Right. And so now you have no targets to kill. And I'm just going to dance around the board. Yeah, I'm not going to score any points. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's how you win. Right. But it's like, this goes back to the intelligent killing concept. It's like, you've got to pick your targets carefully. You've got to whittle targets down carefully. And again, it comes back to the versatility concept where it's like, you need tank, you need kill. Healing's nice. Condition removal. You know, people trying to neutralize your kill models. Because if they can neutralize what model you're using to do the killing, then they aren't under as much pressure. Got it. And, and why condition removal? So distracted and injured are two of the biggest conditions to deal with. Right, distracted, injured, and stunned right. are the three like really big conditions right now. Like yes, yeah, slow still around, poison burning, um, and they still matter. They right. really do. But when you talk about reckoning, which is such a kill oriented scheme, your distracted puts you on negatives to attack, which means you're losing action points to either focus, rectify that, yeah. to rectify that, or have someone assist to remove it. Yeah. So either way, it's an action point disadvantage. Injured puts you on negatives to duels until you end your activation. Okay. Um, or until your next activation, excuse me. Um, so that reduces, you know, your ability to survive. Mm -hmm. And then stun just flat out says no triggers, no bonus actions, which is massively powerful. And uh, it can really cripple certain models. Yeah. And the... You know, the fact that you get uh, th three point, or they count as three, the masters uh, and leaders. Um, yeah, that, don't bring squishy. <laughs> yeah, that, that's definitely going to impact, you know, your decision making. Yeah, absolutely. Both whether who you decide, decide to bring your leader and whether you decide to bring a second, a second master. master. Yeah. Very that's, interesting. That's definitely a thing. So that's the strategies. Um, let's take a second and then we'll uh, jump into schemes. All right, so let's talk schemes. So there's a total of 13 schemes, yep. one for each number in the in your fate deck. Yep. And you end up with a pool of five, mm -hmm. and they'll all be unique, yep. obviously. And the way the schemes work is uh, there are two points available, mm -hmm. you get a point for the reveal yes. and the point for the end. So as we go through these, we're going to talk about the point you get for the first part, which is the reveal, and right. the end. Now, you can score the end without the reveal. Uh, no, I don't believe so. Okay, let's read through it, because I think there might be some where you can do that, but uh, let's check it out. So first, detonate charge. On the reveal, at the start of the turn, if you have at least two friendly scheme markers within two inches of the same enemy model, you may reveal the screen, the, uh, this scheme and remove two such scheme markers to gain one victory point. So I've got to get two markers near you. Right. Um, and it has to be within two inches of the same enemy model, but they have to be four inches from each other. Yeah. Right, because that's that's one of the it's just the base rule. That's just the basic been the basic rules. Yeah. So, not easy, but not impossible. No, not it's it's not really hard. I think the hardest thing about it is that there's not as many pushes, um, right, in in uh, that I've seen so far, and like bells, you know, just do a move, and you know, dead doxies just do a move, and those those are kind of like two of the big pushers. Uh, there's a lot of lures in ten thunders. There's some repositioning in bayou. Um, but uh, it's just, you know, it's just not an extremely prevalent mechanic. So setting up the whole thing of like, you know, I'm just going to drop two ski markers here and just lure somebody all the way over here. It's like some factions can do it. Some, I guess actually a better way to phrase it would be some keywords right. can do it pretty easily. But by and large, it's, it's a little bit tougher than just that. 
So to get the second point, your end, at the end of the game, if you have at least two friendly scheme markers within two inches of the same enemy model, you may remove two such scheme markers to gain one victory point. So it's mm -hmm. the same thing as the reveal. The yeah. big difference being is now my opponent knows. Right. Absolutely. Which makes that second it point. It makes harder. it that second point a lot harder. Right. It's like, you know, it's like, oh, what's that those scheme markers over there? I'm not gonna get anywhere near that. And then of course, with pass tokens, you know, the whole out activation thing, the only way to get really out activated uh, at the moment is um through using pass tokens for mm -hmm. something besides passing, which mm -hmm. a couple of crews do do, or killing a model that hasn't activated in a turn like that will give you activation advantage gotcha um so that but those are really the only two ways so it's like it's not like you can like sneak up you know like i'll just you know move these guys around and wait till you're done activating and then i'm gonna score my end game like right. you know when you're getting to that end game everyone knows we're getting to end game so that's that's just not gonna happen i'll be like no i'm gonna pass you're not you're not getting that free point yep yep and i mean you, you almost have to do it on a model that's already activated Otherwise, he's just going to uh, yeah. activate and run away. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Yeah. I mean, yeah. even if you engage, like disengaging, it's like you'd have to engage in a very specific way yeah. uh, to prevent the push out from being able to. Because, I mean, you flip weak damage on that push out, you know, it's only two inches off. That guy's got a four inch move. I mean, suddenly you're not scoring anything. Yeah. You yeah. know? And this is one of those situations, and you are right. It's uh, You can reveal schemes um, at the end of the game if they haven't been revealed prior. It's just the key is that you can only score one point a turn. Right. So you can't try to double up on that. But in this particular situation, it's it's the same doesn't reveal matter. or end. It doesn't really matter. Yep. It's like you either scored two points or you scored one. It's the same stuff. And a couple of the schemes do that, where it's Excellent. the same thing both. All right, let's talk breakthrough. This is number two. At the end of the turn, if you have one or more friendly scheme markers and a friendly model in the enemy deployment zone, and there are no enemy models within three inches of that model, you may reveal this scheme or remove one such scheme marker to gain one VP. Wow. Yeah. So I've got to get across the board yep. into your deployment zone. Yep. I got to drop a marker. Yep. I need to then keep my model there. Oh yeah. And no that enemies. model can't be within three inches mm -hmm. of any enemy. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's a short that's list. Tough. It's a short list. <laughs> that's it's, tough. It's super easy to do. And actually, it, strangely, I'm not lying. It's actually a lot easier to do than some people think because getting a model to kind of punch through on a flank is not necessarily hard. And it's kind of on, It's it, this one's on your opponent. Right. If you're threatening breakthrough and it's in the scheme pool and your opponent's not reacting to that, that's kind of on them. Yep. There are some models out there that just be like, I, I don't really care. Like again, you know, going to the, the obvious, well, models like Masaki or Colette, who like they can just, you know, bury and then pop up where the, the heck they want to. Um, those types of models, it's a lot harder to, to be able to predict what's gonna happen mm -hmm. there. But even then, um, it's up to your opponent to be like, I'm going to try to guard against this scheme or I'm not going to try to guard against this scheme. And that really is just about positioning and, what, and, the, and the opposing crew and whether well, or not you, splitting your forces like that is going is too detrimental. As valuable as getting a points are, which it sounds a little silly at first, but it, it's hard to get points. Oh, absolutely. So, so just saying, you know what, I'm going to let them have the point, you kind of can't do that. <laughs> you have yeah, to really... Losing a game by one point is not an uncommon right. thing. And it's, you know, getting outplayed on that critical turn is not an uncommon thing. So, yeah, making that decision, it's you got to weigh it. you yeah. got to weigh out that decision. So um, let's talk about the end. At the end of the game, so... The reveal can happen at the end of any turn. At the end of the game, if you have at least three friendly scheme markers in the enemy deployment zone, you may reveal three such enemy scheme markers and gain one VP. So, well, it is what it is, right? Yeah. Um, pretty easy. You gotta just gotta get three markers down there and in in the zone, and obviously they have to be at least four inches apart. Right, um, and that's the hard part. Barring, barring you know anything else that drops scheme yeah. markers. That's the hard so. part because when you think about it, like let's say you're committing a single model to to break through. Um, that model's got to get over to your enemy's deployment zone, which unless you're like in flank, you know, or, yep. or maybe wedge in there at the tip of the wedge is actually fairly, you know, it takes it's going to take a turn or two. Yep. Then you got to drop a scheme marker there. That's going to get eaten yep. for the reveal. And then now you got to drop three more okay. over the, the turns three, four, five. That means you basically have to drop marker, walk, drop marker, walk, drop marker, walk. And, and your not opponent's be, gotta let it happen. Yeah, your opponent's just gotta let that happen. Right. So there's there's a little bit more than you gotta do there. That one that is actually fairly hard to do. It there's, seems like saying I'm gonna just use one model to get breakthroughs a little tough. Yeah, it's it, you definitely have to plan for it. Okay, three, harness the ley line. The reveal at the end of the turn, if you have three or more friendly scheme markers on the center line, you may reveal the scheme, remove three such scheme markers to gain a victory point. So that's pretty basic, right? Pretty basic. You drop three 
three markers on the center line. You're only going to score this once for the reveal, yep. so it doesn't have to all happen on the same turn. So yep. I could theoretically drop one marker one turn, two more markers on the next turn, and then get get it at the end of that right. turn. So at the end, uh, at the end of the game, you have to have three or more friendly scheme markers on the center line, and you may remove them. So you got to do it again. Yeah, you got to do it again. It's like detonate the charges. Um, doesn't matter if you do it for reveal or end. It's going to be the same concept uh, regardless. And the hard part about this scheme, and all schemes, is when you do that reveal, it's going to be so hard to get that end game yep. because getting spending six AP to score two victory points already. That's you know, there's a lot of AP economy you got to take into account there. Um, assuming you don't have bonus actions or anything like that, that can uh, expedite that. Yep. But again, disengaging, disengage. You can't interact. So it's like your opponent can start trying to deny you just by saying, "I'm gonna throw a model on your face." And now you can't interact because you got to disengage or kill me first before that model activates. So you just run into a situation where it's like playing the bluff game is probably the way to go. So that you can kind of like set up what you're going to do. Right. And then just kind of like, all right, here's the, that first point. And then it's almost a win more situation where if you can get the second point, you've probably already got control of the game. But, you know, it's, it's, it's up to your opponent at that point. If they let you get into those positions or they're not careful about guarding a flank, you, you can sneak that out sometimes. And it's, it's you know... It's, it makes a difference. I'll tell you what it feels like. And again, you've played 3rd Edition. I haven't. But what it feels like as I'm going through and reading this is, you know, it was relatively important in previous editions to pay attention to the pool. Yeah. Right? When schemes weren't revealed, you didn't know what your opponent had for schemes. Right. You really, you know, you, you'd you have to pay attention to the pool. Here it seems critical. Oh, it's absolutely critical. And like, and the meta, the meta play is yeah. really, really important here because the games are tighter. The points are harder. And so if you can properly deduce what your opponent's doing, or if you can properly bluff your opponent, you're just, it's, you are so up in that game just from that knowledge yep. there. So, and, and that comes down to that crew selection too. Like if you look at opponent's crew and go, that crew's not very mobile, so they're probably not going to take these two schemes. You know, they're probably going to take one of these three schemes. Now you already know what you're going to have to start trying to deny. And, and like we said, uh, we said a couple of times, generally speaking, that first point is pretty easy to do. Second point's really hard. And the second point is what's going to win you the game. Second point is what's going to win you the game. All right, number four, search the ruins. On the reveal, at the end of the turn, if you have at least two friendly scheme markers on the opponent's table half, each in base contact with a different piece of terrain, you may reveal this scheme and remove two such scheme markers to gain one victory point. So what's interesting to me about that is this is really, like, when I'm looking at the board and deciding which table half I want, it matters, right? Yeah, absolutely. And would I want more terrain on my side or less terrain on my side? Uh, it's hard to say, and, and it's going to depend on the terrain, really, is what's going to come yeah. down to. It's like you got to make it, it factors more into your decision making, though, when you do that. Normally, when you're trying to pick sides, what you're looking at is like if you're a range crew, for instance, you're looking for shooting alleys. If you're a melee crew, you're looking for kill uh, for killing fields, you know, stuff like that. And what you now have to look for is like, is there so much terrain on my side of the table that it makes this easy for my opponent? Because mm-hmm. the easiest terrain to score this off of is terrain on the center line. Right. Because it, it's just, it's right there. You don't have to go far into your opponent's terrain. Yep. And you can drop the marker on, on the center line in base contact with that terrain, and it still counts. Got it. So that's this is actually one of my favorite schemes to play. Hmm. Uh, because of the fact that in Malifaux, there's normally enough terrain on the table that you've got plenty of options to do. And I like to backfield a lot. And, and there's normally, and you know, when we set up terrain tables, not, I don't, not everybody does this, but when we set up terrain tables, we'll have terrain that's in the backfield yep. that doesn't actually typically enter play, to, you know, because that's not where the action's going to happen. But it's there almost for aesthetics and just mm-hmm. kind of completion. Well, now it's it's not just there for that. Now it's like if there's a piece of terrain in the backfield, I might send a scheme runner down there yep. just to drop a marker down. Well, and a lot of the strategies, when we're talking about the strategies, are, are pushing me to that side of the table anyway. Yeah, absolutely. So that's interesting. Absolutely. That's very interesting. The end condition. Uh, At the end of the game, if you have at least three different friendly scheme markers on the opponent's table half, each in base contact with a different piece of terrain, you may remove three such scheme markers to gain one VP. So, reveal plus one. Yep. Pretty straightforward. Same thing applies here. But again, here comes... They know what you're doing. They know what you're doing now. So, it's like that marker you might have dropped and didn't pick up for the reveal. They're like, oh, I got to go get that now. Interesting. Yeah. All right, let's talk number five, dig the graves. After killing an enemy model within one inch of one or more friendly scheme markers, you may reveal the scheme or remove one such scheme marker to gain one VP. So I've got to have, I've got to kill somebody near one of my markers and yep. not a little bit near, very near. Within very an inch. near, within an inch. So it's not, 
it's definitely something that's premeditated. Right. It's, not, it's not one of those. And and this doesn't seem, it, it sounds like this might be hard, but when you think about it, there's not a lot of one, two, of two inch melee ranges. Gotcha. There's a lot of one inch and a lot of zeros. zeros. And then the zero being base to base. So it's like you run into situations where as long as you're not sending a super high reach model there, you can have a, a, you know two models that have a one inch reach outside of charge engagement, drop a scheme marker, and then charge mm -hmm. and go for the kill. So it's not as hard as it sounds, but at the same point in time, if you drop a scheme marker next to an enemy model and they haven't activated, they know what's coming. Right. You know, right. But what's great about this scheme, though, what I love actually about this scheme, is it's a great bluff scheme. Mm -hmm. This is a great scheme to be like comboed with like harness or search the ruins or, or detonate charges that. and just be like, I dropped a scheme marker. What is this for? Yep. And they, if they're going to try to call your bluff on one of those things, it might not be and it might be dig their graves and now they're in a little bit of hurt. So that's just about that meta awareness about your pool and like, you know, you see your opponent engineering stuff, you got to be like, are you trying to fake me out? Mm -hmm. What's going on? Well, and you've got the bluff aspect, but the other aspect of it is you have, you know, you can only use one scheme marker for each yeah. thing, so you have potentially competing, oh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, competing objectives, you know, or competing uh, uh, schemes. If you're not careful, yeah. where you need this marker to do two things, it can only do one thing. Um, and again, for most models, they, ha they can't drop scheme markers within, within four. four inches of another one, so yeah. uh, that's tough. That's yeah. tough. But the the one positive about that though is that because you you know you're only trying to score two points per scheme. You have a little bit of flux there. So if right. you drop a scheme marker and you really need it for two schemes, as long as it's not like turn four or five type thing where you're running in, where you're running out of time there, uh, you, you can usually recover from that. Got it. So the uh, the end, at the end of the game, if you have at least three different scheme markers within one inch of three different corpse or scrap markers, you may remove three such scheme markers to gain one VP. So that's interesting. It's very different than the reveal here. Mm -hmm. Um and I could have not scored the reveal, and at the right. end of the game, I can score it. The other thing that's interesting is, you know, sometimes when you know you start the game off, you'll you know, and a model dies, you go, anybody, any of your crew use scrap markers? Does any of your crew use right. corpse markers? It looks like we need to do that just every, pretty much every game, yeah. but definitely when Dig Your Graves is in play. Yeah, and that's a thing, and that's that's a hard thing to, to talk about too. But in a certain point, I had this happen in a game just recently where I was playing against someone Dig, dig Their Graves were in the pool, and we did that. Mm -hmm. We did the obligatory. Do you need them? Do you need them? And I was like, well, actually, Dig's in the pool. We should drop these. And it's like that almost telegraphs if you have it or not. Right. If you have to, if you have to, no, I need you to drop that scrap, that corpse or scrap marker. It's like, oh, okay, I and know all, what you've got. We all, we almost, I think, need to probably get in the habit of. At the Just, beginning of the game, yeah. saying, by the way, digs in the pool. Digs in the pool. We got sure. to do that so that there's no. And it's two ways. So that, you know, someone's not trying to bluff you by going, no, I need that corpse. You're like, oh, you've got to dig their graves and they're totally faking you out. Yeah. Um, but uh, the thing I really like about, most about dig their graves, we saw this a little bit in uh, Search the Ruins. Um, and in Breakthrough, the variation between the reveal and the end. I yep. really like that because if you run into a situation where you can't kill things, but you're getting killed, you can still score a point off the other yep. yep. graves. All right. Uh, number six, hold up the forces. For the reveal, at the end of the turn, if you have at least two friendly models, each engaging a different enemy model with a higher cost than itself, you may reveal the scheme to gain one victory point. So I need... Two, two things engaged. Yep. Each of those models have to have a lower, not equal, a lower cost than, whatever cost they're than what they're engaged with. Then I get to score. Yeah. This, okay. This is the scheme that I have the most trouble with. Yeah. It is absolutely a devastatingly hard scheme to score because you got to catch your opponent off guard mm -hmm. and not die in the process. And it can be easy in some perspectives, like, but it depends on what your opponent brings. So yeah. like, you've always got one target, and that's the master, the leader. The leader is going to be anywhere between 11 to 16 points, mm -hmm. depending on who it is. So you run into a situation there where you've got that one that you can get in pretty much guaranteed. But then you've got that second one. And depending on what you, your prone have brought, that could be a lot harder to do. Well, and putting a model next to a master is not, not normally yeah, a good idea. Not normally a good idea at all. <laughs> yeah. um, the one thing that's kind of interesting is that because we have a sliding kind of scale of master power levels and yeah. they're, and it's kind of determined by their soul stone cost, there are some masters that are cheaper than others and some, you know, and by you know, proxy, more than, some that are more expensive. So you run into a situation where, like, you can throw a master up against another master, and it can count for this. Interesting. So yeah. I find I find that like Lynch comes to mind because he's only eleven soul stones, or I think Dreamer is also like eleven or twelve soul stones only. Um, 
But uh, you throw them up against, you know, anyone who's normal 15, and sure. suddenly they count for hold up their forces. And then, like, they've got a hench for 10, you know. A last activation minion throwing in there can get you that second point. Uh, I think the hard part is the, is uh, doing it again, which I think is the end. Yeah, and I think that uh, you also you need to look at how their force is built and how your force is built, oh, right? Absolutely. You know, yeah. so if you're in a situation where your crew is most of the models are tied or equal to their crew and stuff yeah, like that, this may not be the may not be the one to pick. Yeah. So let's talk about the end. At the end of the game, you have at least two friendly models, each engaged with a different enemy model with a higher cost. It's the same thing. Uh, yep. Game one yep. of AP, so you have to do it twice. You got to do it twice. And that's uh, that's what I'm saying. That second one's the hard yeah. one. Like, you can kind of get that first one. You can force that through. You can brute that through. But once you reveal it, they're going to be like, oh, that's not happening again. Yeah. And now you've got to get into, like, super positioning game because... And you're running uh, out of models. You're running out of models. And it's like, <laughs> the thing that kills me about this particular scheme is that it's not equal or greater. It's yeah. greater. And the seven soul stone sweet spot, the six, seven soul stone sweet spot, that really hurts that point because yeah. you bring that seven soul stone model and your opponent's got his seven soul stone models, like they, they aren't going to count for each other. So it's like you got to go against something higher, and that's dangerous. It's good. I like it. Yeah. All right, seven, take prisoner. At the beginning of the game, secretly choose an enemy minion. For the reveal, at the end of the turn, if you have a friendly model engaging the secretly chosen model and there are no other enemy models within four inches of the secretly chosen model, you may reveal this scheme to gain one victory point. So I pick a target. Yep. I've got to engage the target. Yep. Um, it doesn't say I could have multiple ones, right? Not just one friendly model, a friendly model, yep. so I could have two. Yep, doesn't But matter. the key is, is that he has to be somewhat isolated, that yep. enemy model. It's got to be a minion that is somewhat isolated. Oh, that's, sure enough, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's got to be a minion. And and that's the hard Oh, one. that's a big deal. That's a big deal. Like, especially, like, someone like me, I like to play elite crews. Yeah. And it's not... Sometimes I will bring a crew that has no minions, and that scheme's just flat out to nine. Sure, or even if there's just two minions, you're yeah, drastically like, reduced. Yeah, drastically reduced pool there. So yeah. it's like, that's a, that's one of those schemes that you can build your crew to deny mm -hmm. uh, fairly easily. Um, and the other thing about that's... Uh, that's interesting is again the, we've mentioned this a couple of times the lack of pushes yeah the lack of there's not as many of those as you might want right to do a scheme like this so you've really got to you've got to pay attention to what you're trying to do and of course there's a couple of masters that it's kind of an auto thing yoku the new 10th thunder master uh seamus with his bells yeah they're gonna have the movement to be able to isolate one of your minions if you're not too careful with it but it's again just kind of one of those things where you got to play that meta and be like all right take prisoners in the pool where are my minions how am i going to use these yep. guys yeah very interesting at the end of the game, if you have a friendly model engaging the secretly chosen model, or if the, if the secretly chosen model was killed by an enemy model after this scheme was revealed, gain one victory point. So, scheme has been revealed, which means I've yep. already gotten a point off of it. Yep. If the enemy kills that model... To try to deny you. To the try point. to deny it, then yeah. I get the point. Yeah, and so, that's that's the whole reason for that clause is because that's that was uh that's something that like comes up a lot is like you know oh well you know I'll you, just kill you need you need this model alive for whatever you're trying to do well I'll just eat that model it's like that's a very common tactic in miniature games in general um, or in gaming in general yeah. it's a common tactic the the sacrificial pawn concept yeah, yeah. and uh, so this says nope can't do that you got you got to leave them up um, <laughs> you've got to hit him. Hit him. If you're having this played against you, you just got to get the hell out of there. Yeah, it, literally. You just literally have to get out. And sometimes that's just not easy yeah, to do. Yeah, yeah. So. Sometimes it is. All right, eight, power ritual. Reveal is at the end of the turn, if you have a friendly scheme marker within three inches of a table corner, not part of your deployment zone, you may reveal the scheme to remove that scheme marker to gain one victory point. So basically, get out of your deployment zone, drop a scheme marker within three inches of the table corner, um, and... Now, the table corner has to be not part of your deployment zone. Yes. As opposed to not dropping it in your deployment zone. So it really pushes you to the other side of the board. It really again. does. So yep. we, we have the four deployments. We have the wedge, flank, standard, corner. So corner and flank still have the, you know, uh, don't traipse into the other corners. So you have three corners that you right. can possibly tag. So this scheme is much easier to score in those two scenarios. But when you're doing standard or wedge, the wedge hits two corners, mm -hmm. your standard hits two corners, so that means you're going to your opponent's deployment zone. Yeah, now in wedge, would I still ha yeah, I still have two available to me. Yes, you right. still have two yep. available Got to it. you. Got it. So at the, at the end, uh, at the end of the game, if you have at least three different uh, friendly scheme markers within three inches of three different table corners, 
and no more than one of those scheme markers is in your deployment zone, you may remove these scheme markers to gain one VP. So you got to get two more markers down. Two more markers. Well, three, three more markers because it's, it's going to pick it up. Yep, it's going to pick it up on the first up. one. But again, if I... Well, yeah, you. I guess you would always score the reveal before the end here. Yeah. Um, yeah. So okay. More like more likely than not, because it's going to be easier to do that. Right. And it's not. Then it's going to be and the bo other both. Both's a point. So right. Both. Yeah. A, both gets you a point. The key for this one is that you know they were nice enough to add the clause that like one can be in your deployment zone. Um, so you can prep that. One. Yep. So in wedge and standard deployment, you can have a model drop one in a corner, even as a bluff, which I still think is a great option. Um, you bluff power ritual, and then you send someone down a flank, and it's especially if covert if breakthroughs in the pool like mm -hmm. that. Just like you're, that's that's a target that your opponent's like, I cannot ignore that. Like they literally can't because they're potentially throwing away two to four points by ignoring that that model. So it's a really great way to kind of split your opponent's attention, and especially if you're not actually doing it, and that is a sacrificial model, you've just kind of weighed things a little bit more in your favor. All right, let's talk about number nine, outflank. For the reveals, at the end of the turn, if you have two models, each within three inches of where the center line meets a different table edge or corner, you may reveal this scheme to gain one victory point. So we've got to go, you've got to go out, right? Yeah, you've got to go you out. You have to head out uh, to the center line, which is the center line being different than the deployment zones, obviously, mm -hmm. but the deployment zones determine whether it's a uh, diagonal or, a, or a center line or not. Yep. And uh, they've got to go out there. There's no other restrictions, so they can be engaged yep. and so on and so forth. So relatively easy. Yeah. Though when you see it happening. You yeah, know, it's it's super telegraphed. Yeah. Um, Again, this is a good scheme that's best paired with another scheme that requires you to be spread apart, like a Search the Ruins or a Harness the Ley Line. Not necessarily to take it with it, mm -hmm. but just to be able to bluff it. So, like, if you go for the outflank and, like, really what you're doing is Search the Ruins, you can kind of redirect your guys after your opponent tries to split off after you. But, uh, the actually, in, in the, and there's no NDA, so we can, I can say this, in the beta, you had to do it without enemies being nearby. <laughs> and that was super hard. Yeah, I bet. That was super hard. So, I like this version a lot better where it's, like, just you got to get there. Because it's already hard enough. Yep. Depending on what scheme you're doing. If you're doing corner, for instance, this scheme's a nightmare to do because you just got to waste so much AP to get up there. And it forces you into certain builds. And again, that mobility positioning becomes like paramount one more time. Well, you have to, I mean, and this is something that uh, we'll, we'll talk about at the end. Um, yeah. I'm getting excited because <laughs> remember, I haven't played yet. and You need to. You need this to. Is, so good. Oh, I, I, it, I mean, if there's one thing that I loved about Malifaux from the beginning and where I think Weird has kept kept themselves above all other war games is what we're talking about right now is the schemes and the strategies Absolutely. and that whole concept of the cool and just the way that they did scoring um you don't see anything like this and i have to say and we've only got a couple more left they've really taken it to another level here like this i can tell you right now after playing you know three years of malifaux these are better than any of the gaining ground combinations I've seen. Just yeah. structurally, there's some really good decisions here. But I'm getting distracted here, so it's let's right. talk... Uh, be excited, be excited. Yeah. It's amazing. Let's talk 10, Assassinate. Yeah. The reveal at the end of the One turn. One of my favorites. If the enemy leader is in play and has half of its maximum health or less, you may reveal the scheme to gain one victory point. So, so go ahead and read the end one because this okay. just ties in directly. And the end is at the end of the game, if the enemy leader is not in play, you gain a victory point. Yeah, so this is this is just flat out, just go forth and murder. Interesting. And uh, what I love about this scheme is um, you can't have your master sit back in this in, in M3E. You got to get up. Mm -hmm. You got to get to your opponent's side of the tail. Like we we discussed this, it's brought, it's been brought up time and again in the strategies and the scheme pushing to your opponent's half of the table to get stuff done. So your master is not going to be sitting in the backfield going, you know, hebe -de -hebe -de. Right. he's got to get up and he's got to do his job. He's mm -hmm. got to support your crew or he's got to lead your crew or, you yep. know, she's got to go and murder those things or, you know, whatever the case may be. Lady J's got to come down and bring the sword of vengeance on everything. Yeah. So this scheme I love because it makes it, it turns this, it turns the aggression dial up to 11. And in a situation where we're already needing to mix it up so aggressively just to accomplish our normal strats and schemes, adding in that extra fear yeah. of what happens if I take, you know, a couple, one too many shots on my leader. Is this person, is my opponent going to score an extra point for assassinate? Because I, I, I got to tell you, there are a couple of times, especially like when I play Asami because her totem uh, gets an upgrade when she dies that turns him into a super totem. 
and uh, I'll let her die. Right. And like you can't do that with yeah. assassin, obviously. No. Nope. So it just kind of it gives you again just another little thing to think about, and I like the the threat. Um, though I will say it makes Colette like you know an almost an auto take again into an assassin. If that's in the pool, yeah, because she's un- like unkillable. <laughs> well, the one thing I think is interesting though, and this goes into with Colette and Masaki and stuff like that, is the no- at the end of the game, it's not that did you kill the master? Yeah, it's are they in is play? It, is the master in play? Yeah. Which uh, you know can be that you could potentially get that point and the master's still alive, right? Right, yeah, and like you got to be careful about that. And it's like and those fortunately those abilities are controlled by the right. owner. So you got to not be paying attention. But if you're not paying attention like, and buried is not you. considered in play. No. So things like pine boxings could be a potentially a thing, right? Uh, I believe that is correct. I'm pretty certain that uh, you still get to activate the model, but it's it's not counted as being in play. Interesting. No. All right, number 11, we're almost done. Deliver a message. At the beginning of the game, secretly choose an enemy leader or master. Reveal. During its act... Well, let's talk about that real quick. At the beginning of the game, secretly choose an enemy leader or master. And it took me a second to realize why does that matter. It's because you can have multiple, you have multiple masters. masters. Yeah. So if someone brings two masters, I could choose either one. The, right. the one that's the leader or the second or third master. Or alternatively, if someone brings in a henchman as their leader, then you, you can, can still nominate that. That, Got the it. leader. All right. During its activation, a friendly model within one inch of the secretly chosen model can take an interact action to target the secretly chosen model, even if the friendly model is engaged. If it does so, you may reveal the scheme to get one victory point. So you're delivering the message. You're delivering you're the running message. up to the chosen leader or master, and you're saying, here, here's the message. This, so this scheme for me, if if we were ranking schemes, this one would probably be one of the weaker schemes for me. Not not because it's not a good scheme or anything like that, but because that first point is so easy to get. Got it. There is almost like you really have to be not paying attention to not score deliver the message. Now there are a couple of masters that I know I just was talking about that you really can't leave your master in the backfield, but there are some masters like the Zoraida, mm-hmm. you know, or Dreamer, you know, Asami even, um, who are a little more mid table to you know back models where or Sonia comes to mind as well. That you know just that range blasty, they aren't getting too close. Got it. So in those particular situations, um, deliver the message can be a little bit harder. And then if you suddenly try to blitz a model in there, we're like, oh, mm-hmm. you got that. But uh, for the masters that like to mix it up, it's like you got to be careful about that because you dive in and do what you do. And then your opponent goes, thank you. Here, have a message. I got a VP. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and again, and this is something I like, is the fact that I need this is going this is potentially the, this being in the pool is going to impact my decision making. Yes. And as far as crew building, and it's mm-hmm. also whether I pick it or not is going to be determined by what I see on the other side of the table. Yeah, which is which has always been what Malifaux has been, you know, best about is that kind of meta dynamic. Yeah. And uh it's just the stuff they're doing with M3 is just reinforcing all of that. That's great. Yeah. All right, let's talk about uh, 12 claim jump. No, let's do the end for deliver. Oh, I'm sorry. Message. The end on uh, deliver a message. At the end of the game, if the secretly chosen model is still in play and within two inches of a friendly scheme marker, or if the secretly chosen model was killed by an enemy model after the scheme was revealed, gain one victory point. So a little bit different than the assassin. you got to yeah. kill it, or you've got to get it near a marker. Yeah. That's hard. Yeah. <laughs> That's potentially hard. Because, again, they know the deliver the message has been revealed. They know right. that you've picked it. All right, so now 12 uh, claim jump. At the beginning of the game, secretly choose a friendly non-leader model. Reveal. At the end of the turn, if there are no enemy models within three inches of the secretly chosen model and the secretly chosen models within two inches of the center point, you may reveal the scheme to gain one victory point. Oh, wow. Okay. There's a lot going on. So there. you got to pick one of your models. Yep. Can't be the leader. One. Cannot be the leader. And it has to be somewhat isolated, not within three inches yep. of an enemy, and it has to be within two inches of the center point. It's. It, I have taken this scheme so many times, and I have failed to score a victory point off of it so many times because it's really, really hard sometimes to judge when your opponent's going to go center. Right. And if claim jumps in the pool, you kind of have to assume at least something's coming center. But just how much is there? And that three inch to two inch range can really play havoc with you sometimes because if they get a model up in that center point. You and can't it's not score. the center line. Yeah, no. It's the center it's point. It's the center point wow. of the table. So if they get within, I think it's it's something like within an inch of the center point, you can't score. Like, you physically cannot score. Yeah. Because that three-inch versus two-inch reach, uh, two-inch range on, on the requirements Whew, prevents that. Tough. It's super, super tough. I have to get, get to the center point, and I have to be there by myself. You have to be there by yourself, basically. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. And large-based models just, like, say, Forget nope. It. 
Yep. Just nope to that. Like, oh, I'm just going to drop Yasunori on the center of that table and say, shift me. Because yep. unless you do, you're not scoring claim jump this whole game. And the other key is, is I can't, it's not just a situation where I just get a model there. It has to be a specific model. It has to be a specific yeah. model. And that's, that's just another, you know, variable that tough. just makes it tough. So the end is at the end of the game, if you if the secretly chosen model is still in play and half or more of its maximum health and within two inches of the center point, gain one victory point. So it's got to live and it's got to be there. Yeah, so the one this is where the whole thing of being able to score the second part without scoring the first yeah. part kind of really comes into play. And we didn't talk about this with Deliver the Message, but um, Deliver the Message is one of those things where you can do this, the same thing. Where yep. It's like if you aren't ever actually able to get that message off but you're able to drop the scheme marker kill the model then mm -hmm. like you know you still get the point claim jump same thing here you may not have been able to get yourself isolated but at the end of the game if you're above half health and you're still in that center point model or not you're going to get that point got it and so it's actually strangely enough it's i think it's easier to score the, the end point, point. Yeah. than it is to score not the, the reveal point, point the end point yeah. yeah yeah okay last one 13 vendetta at the beginning of the game, secretly choose a friendly non-totem model and an enemy non-leader model with a higher cost. So I pick one of my models, I pick one of your models, it has to be higher cost, and it can't be a... Totem or leader. Uh, I can't be a totem, yep. and you can't be a leader. Yep, 100%. So the reveal, at the end of the friendly model's activation, if it successfully dealt damage to the secretly chosen model and the enemy model is, has half its maximum health or less, but it's still in play, you may reveal this scheme to gain one victory point. So now my model has got to hit your model. Mm -hmm. Your model has to be... Has, at, has to be either at half... Or lower. Or lower. And I get a victory point. After the hit. Got it. So the thing that's really good about that is that it doesn't have it doesn't like it doesn't have to be the first model or anything like that. Right. You just have to get it past at half. At some point I have to make that hit happen when you're right. at at half or lower. Right. Okay. So the end at the end of the game if the friendly model is in play and the enemy model is not, game one victory point. So I've got to that's cool. I like right. that. I've got yeah. to survive and you've got to be gone. And what's really good about and again this goes back to uh, with the clam jump deliver the message concept with you know the second part of the scheme versus the first part. Um, the reveal can be hard to pull off sometimes, especially because if you spike damage and then you cheat it down because you don't want to kill the model, they're like, oh, right, I know what you want. Um, and so you can deny at least one of the victory points by killing the model then. And yep. We talked about the whole sack bomb thing uh, for Take Prisoner. Um, and that one's, that one's totally valid. Like, you'll give them up the point Assuming you don't kill their 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 vendetta tar their vendetta nominee, right? You could still potentially deny it. Yeah, you could still potentially deny it, but you at least absolutely deny that reveal. Right. Um, and that's one of those things where it's just like you know you got to be careful with what you're doing. But the benefit of the end point is that if they go and you you spike a red joker damage or whatever, and they're like, all right, fine, you know, I'm down to two hit points. Mm -hmm. um, you can still just kill that model. And still get the one victory point as long as your vendetta nominee is still up, and that can be hard to kind of source out because if you're in this situation where you know you got four other schemes you're trying to worry about, you're playing your two schemes, you're playing a strat, your opponent's not revealed one of their schemes, you might think it's a dead scheme, and you yeah. don't realize it's because that sniper in the back line that you've not gotten to at all was their vendetta nominee yeah so now they're going to get that one point and you just didn't even know it was coming yeah so that's something that's actually kind of cool about the vendetta. Um, not being able to target leaders, not totally sold on that. Mm -hmm. I understand why, yep. because they're all 15, 16, so it's right. like you just be like, oh, my big beater Henshi Zamu, or yep. Enforcer Zamu is going to come through and murder you. But um, it is what it is, and uh, again, this is one of those schemes that I, I talked a little bit earlier about, like, when you, uh, for Hold Up Their Forces, that you get to that point where you're really struggling to find models that are within the the cost range of the requirements that can get the job done yeah and this is one of those situations where it's like i like for instance for me i build a lot of elite crews at times and i don't have a model that's below eight stones yeah so now i have to go after a henchman and that's that can be really hard sometimes or you don't pick the scheme or i just don't pick the scheme yeah, yeah. and it's like sometimes you're just pigeonholed into schemes there's nothing really you can do about it. it's like you're like oh well all of these suck for what i brought yeah you know, so you just got to kind of work with what you got. That's good. All right. We'll be right back with our final thoughts. All right. So we'll start with me. Um, I am excited to try these out. Um, it's a little hard for me to get my brain around. I think I'm going to struggle when I get my first pool in front of me trying to figure it out. Um, how interlocked 
all things are. I mean, each scheme is its own scheme, each strategy is its own strategy, but I can already see a pool how they interact with each other. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, it uh, that's very, very exciting. I think that um, when your opponent hasn't revealed his schemes yet, because of how interlocked they all are, mm -hmm. it'll be a little tough, yeah. I think, to figure out what how they're going to get that first point. Yeah. Um, I like that uh, there's some killy, some not killy. Um, I like position. The, yeah, the positioning is interesting. Yeah. The strategy seem to have a very specific you need to be in certain places on the board for things to happen. Yeah. Schemes are a lot more flexible, right? Things oh, can absolutely. happen at different points. Not all of them, but some of them. So um, I'm excited. I mean, you've played some games. What are your thoughts? Um, I really like it. Like initially, uh, some of the early permutations that we went through in the closed beta, uh, I wasn't as quite a big a fan of. But what the the settling on the reveal in the end concept and the scaling strats, I, that's just for me. That's that's money. Yeah. The, the scaling, what, so what it does is it does two things. Number one, it makes games tighter. And like, there's there's an argument to be had for, of they're going to be tired because you're engineering it to be that way. Right. Because the first couple of points are easier to score. But I don't see a problem with that. I don't either. Personally. It's like, <laughs> I don't have a problem with it being it where like people can be interactive in the game. Right. And actually accomplish things. And where like the where the victory is going to come from is going to be the strategy you employ to yeah. get the difficult points. I would be very hesitant about how tight the... I mean, because you're right. It's engineered to be tight games. Yes. And I would be very... I would have a problem with that if... And I can say this confidently just even reading them. And I, I assume you're going to back me up here. Is... The person who plays better is going to win. Yes. Right? Yeah. So so you want to engineer a close game, but still have a game where the person who played the best that game is probably going to win? Right. I'm okay with that. I mean... Uh, absolutely. For all of the different war games that I've tried, the luck factor is the lowest in Malifaux. Um, yeah, it really is. And you... I just consistently... The, the person who plays better from... And it's not just play... Pick the best crew. You can't pick a crew in Malifaux and win the game. No. In other war games, you can have won during crew building or yeah, army oh, building. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can't just pick certain schemes and certain strategies and win the game. No. I mean, you, you have gotta to engineer it. Right crew. You have to mm -hmm. play well. You have to control your resources. You have to make good decisions yep. from the beginning well. to the end. And that's why it's my favorite game. Yeah, absolutely. And I 100% agree with everything you just said there. Uh, for me, the, the big thing about this is that. And and there might be some ar some argument to be had here, depending on how competitive you know what your viewpoint on competition is. Um, I find I get people more excited about a game that they're not going to get. Yeah. You know, I I got scored eight points, you scored zero. Right. You know, like when they feel that they've accomplished something in a game, you want to come back to it, even if you lost the game. And like the worst thing in the world, you know, it, it, it's a, a term we get thrown around a lot. The whole MPE, the not the not positive experience. I feel like one of the benefits of how they've engineered the strat and the schemes to have closer games kind of helps reduce that a bit because you're able to get a couple of points by just playing a solid game. Yep. And then if you get outdone because your opponent's better than, you know, better at the tactics or they did better deployment or they did better crew selection or a combination of what it is, you know, you still were able to do your thing. Yep. They just did theirs better. And I think that's a really good environment to play and I think it's a good environment to be in. Yeah, and the ramping nature of those strategies means you know if i'm going into turn three turn four and i'm one or two points behind it's going to be easier for me to get my points than right. it is for you to score that other point right you know? and i like that i like yeah. that and still like you're still going to run into those situations where someone who is like a severely high skill level versus someone who maybe isn't you're still going to get blowout games once in a while where yep. someone does do the eight one or the eight zero type thing um but i gotta tell you i've probably played about well over 30 beta games mm -hmm. I have not yet scored an eight zero game. That's that's good. Yeah, I that's haven't good. scored. I've gotten eight points multiple times. I've gotten eight points multiple times. Most of my games, I've been six three, seven four type things, and that's kind of what we're talking about. Where like you know, you get that kind of first point or two of the strategy. You get one or two point. You know, you get one or two points from the reveal yep. or one or one half of your of your schemes, but getting the other half of your scheme. Or getting those three, four points, and it's like I find that my the way I've been playing has been to try to deny the turn three strat. Yep. The turn three strat denial is really important for me because if I can deny you a point there and then score a point on turn three, that's a two point swing for me. Yep. 
Um, and I feel that that's really, really, really critical. So that's that kind of decide the game. Yeah, that could absolutely decide yeah. the game. So that's kind of where I push my denial at the moment is for that. Great. So let us know in the comments. Um, for those of you that have been playing, I want to know what you think about uh, these different schemes. Is there certain schemes that you think are always picked? So there's schemes that you never would pick. Um, let us know if we made a mistake. Let us know yeah, in the comments as well so we can get it fixed. Uh, make sure you like and subscribe. Um, we've got a lot more uh, uh, third edition uh, content yeah, uh, to get out to you. So you're going to want to be notified when that happens. So make sure you hit the bell. Uh, Ray, it was a pleasure. Always a pleasure, Craig. We'll see you next time.